I turn it over to you, Brian. Good morning. On behalf of the Education Committee at the Hudson Gateway Association of Realtors, one moment. Uh, we wanna thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, I am Brian Phillips, Vice Chair of Education and Associate Broker at Douglas Selman Real Estate, along with Tony Crystal, Chair of the Education Committee and Associate Broker at Houlihan Lawrence. To start, start the event, we'd like to invite the 2022 HGR President, Anthony Domathadi, and Broker Owner of Exit Realty Premium to welcome everyone. Thank you, Brian. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Brian, thanks for the intro. Um, and I, before I see this panel, and I am so excited that this is going to be a great webinar, uh, great discussion. I just wanted to share my thoughts. Uh, traditionally, the summer months that comprise most of Q3 are characterized by slower home buying activity than Q2. When spring brings out more, more buyers, I think we are likely to see some price reductions uh, partially due to seasonality, but also sell sellers contend with the reality of uh, slower buyer demand. Uh, affordability is the key right now in the housing market. And I believe that both home prices and mortgage prices have risen and shutting the door for many potential first-time buyers who are having a difficult time. Um, all, in, all in all, while buyer demand remains strong, home prices will continue to climb, although it is expected that prices will be probably a moderate growth. Um, Brian, I also think that the housing panel always cools down this time of the year, but I think this fall may be a little bit more frigid as sales dry up a little bit more than usual. I'm, I'm looking at Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac reports uh, or year to year growth. I see in 2022, we've reached 16% appreciation in home prices and Freddie Mac in his, uh, report pre predicts that the home buyer demand will moderate in the months ahead, you know, and switching from a hot housing market in the last two years to a more normal pace. That being said, we have a panel of experts. So I will stop and I will let them weigh in and I'm going to turn it back to you, Brian. Thank you. Uh, Chris, Tony, will you uh, introduce our moderate, our um, Nadia, rather? Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Tony Crystal, Chair of HGAR Education Committee. I'd like to introduce our special guest speaker today, Nadia Evangelou from NAR, who will speak today on the trends of the current market and what we can expect this year and next year. Nadia is the Senior Economist and Director of Forecasting with the National Association of Realtors. She holds a master's degree in applied economics from John Hopkins University, as well as an advanced degree in international European economics and public administration. It's my pleasure to turn over the Zoom screen to Nadia. Hi, Tony. Uh, thank you for the introduction and good morning, uh, everyone. Um, before signing my presentation, I would like to thank you for having me here today and giving me the opportunity to discuss with you about the latest market trends like nationwide and specifically in the uh, New York metro area. Uh, today, today morning, like just right now, like Freddie Mac uh, released like the mortgage rate. Uh, and what we see that like they're, uh, they're continue to escalate actually is like now at 6.3%. They just released that from last week. It was like about like 6%. So what we see is that in fact, we see that rates are about like more than 3% that points like higher than a year ago. Uh, but how much higher like rates will go? So and uh, how are these rates going to affect uh, home buyers and the local market um, uh, in the upcoming like months. So these are uh, some of the questions that uh, we will try to respond today. Uh, but before discussing these topics, uh, let's first take a look at some uh, very important like economic indicators that will help us understand uh, better the market. So I will start sharing my screen. Just bear with me. And I hope you can see it now, right? Uh, perfect. Yes, we can. Perfect. So let's start first with the labor market. Uh, it's remarkable to see 
uh, these strong job gains that we had, like specifically the economy was able to recover like all the jobs that were lost in the beginning like of the pandemic. Actually, there are like more jobs now than back like in March like 2020 when the pandemic hit our country. Specifically, there are about like 1.7 million more jobs now as of like August, we have like the latest data than back in March like of 2020. Uh, in the meantime, unemployment rate is near like record lows, like uh, near 4%, which indicates how strong the labor market is since like it shows how many people who want a job and are available for work can find a job. Uh, in fact, what we see is that there are like two jobs um, for every like unemployed person. That's the, the job market recovery after the pandemic has been remarkable, like rapid compared to other like notable like recoveries in recent history. Um, but then when we take a look uh, at the job creation by, by area, we see that there are substantial like variations in job growth uh, across the country. Like for instance, as you can see in the map, Utah and Idaho are the two states with the fastest like employment growth like across the country. Uh, actually, it's uh, also very promising. It's very good to see that more and more states are joining the list with job gains, such as like Montana, Florida, Texas, Georgia, and the Carolinas. In fact, the, the, there are about like 25 states that have like a job gains compared to March of 2020. So in these states, as you can see in the map with blue color, not only the local economy was able to recover the jobs that were lost due, uh, due to the pandemic, but there are actually more jobs now than then like in March of 2020. Like for example, in both Utah and Idaho, there are more than 6%, like uh, about like 7%, like as you can see, like more jobs. So this is great news for all these areas. And why is this important? Like, or otherwise what uh, a strong job growth like means for the real estate market, uh, as more people enter back into workplace, uh, demand for housing like is expecting uh, typically is expected to remain strong as they set their sight into home ownership. However, what we see in New York, like statewide, we see that we haven't recovered yet, like all the jobs. Uh, when we compare the number of jobs uh, in July, because this is the figure we have, like for the local level, with the jobs back in March of 2020, we have about like two percent, like fewer jobs now than then. Um, I know that many of you uh, here, like you specialize, like in counties such as like New York, uh, Bronx, Brooklyn. Register, uh, Putnam, um, uh, Rockland, and Orange counties. And actually, all these counties are included in the New York metro area. So I will I will talk a lot uh, about this metro area like today. Uh, so, for example, about the job market in this area, like what do we see? Uh, we actually get that the New York metro area is also missing like jobs compared to pre-pandemic. Uh, specifically, we need to create to add about like 140,000. Uh, additional jobs in order to be back like to the pre-pandemic like level. That's, I think that we will probably um, recover these jobs in the next like five to six months uh, in order to be back like uh, to the March levels that we had uh, for this area. Um, then let's talk um, a little bit about inflation, which is one of the main like drivers of the economy and the housing market. And what do we see? Uh, new inflation numbers actually like released uh, like uh, recently, and the data was disappointing. Like inflation in August um, uh, rose faster than expected by like eight point three percent. Although prices like eased slightly in August, like compared to uh, July, like in uh, inflation. What we see is like inflation continue to rise like very fast. Uh, it's not the 9.1%, for example, or the 8.5% seen like in the past two months, but this number is higher than uh, what we expected, like given the retreat in the gasoline like prices. Um, a significant like, contributor to inflation was rapidly uh, rising like rents, uh, which like rose up like 7%, 6.7% from one year ago. That, which is like the fastest growth in nearly like 40, uh, like in almost like four decades. 
And rent prices, we, we expect that will continue to accelerate in the near term as like rental demand remains like high uh, from the ongoing like job additions uh, and the higher like um, mortgage rates, like forcing some people um, out of the market so they cannot afford to buy the typical home like uh, in the market so they they continue to rent so to answer the question like of what we should expect from inflation in the following months i will say that if there is a sustained decline uh, in gasoline like prices and more production of apartments and single family homes so we have more construction consumer prices will pull back thus this deceleration could help the Federal Reserve like to reduce the inflation to be back closer to the uh, 2% like target that they have. Um, however, consumers should have in mind that prices will not continue to increase, like uh, they, they will continue to increase, but at a slower pace. This is what we we have to emphasize. Like it's not that prices will stop like increasing, it's about the pace of the increase which will likely continue to be slower like in the months ahead. Also, it will take like several months. Uh, also, we have to have this in mind that it, it, it takes like several months for, um, for the Federal Reserve to achieve like the 2% like tag, target of inflation. And according to the Federal Reserve, inflation will likely be like 4.5 by, by the end of the year. But uh, the, these changes as they can see that uh, inflation is uh, uh, continues to be like very elevated. Mm. As a result, um, mortgage rates continue to escalate, like surpassing six percent. Like today, they just announced at six point three, six point twenty nine uh, specifically. Um, have in mind that the the uh, the main factors that affect like uh, today's like uh, mortgage market is like the expectations that we have on inflation. Uh, the expectations on uh, economic growth and the expectations about the Fed's like uh, rate hike. Uh, inflation, first of all, like inflation and high interest rates, like uh, rate hikes, typically move up yields as investors like demand a higher rate. And this is what happened. Like, for example, yesterday, the Federal Reserve uh, had like for the third time, uh, seven, um, 0.75 like of a percentage point like increase. So this is what um, brought like the... Uh, the the mortgage rates like higher like uh, today even though i personally i didn't expect to see like this reaction like immediately nevertheless we have to have in mind that concerns about a slower economic growth can put a hold like um on the pace of the increase of the rates like in the meantime the bond market uh, is showing like signs that there are persistent like fears about the economy and especially with the uh, with a uh, rate hike that we had like uh, recently as well. So what we see is that the shorter term uh, bonds such as like the two uh, year uh, yields like continue to have a higher yield than the longer term ones, even though they have like a lower risk. Thus, and this is, uh, uh, this like uh, spread shows like the, the concern that investors have about how the economy will react like how it will behave after like three um, rate hikes of uh, that magnitude. Thus, I expect uh, mortgage rates like to hover around like 6.1%, like 6.2%, like for the remainder like of the year. But rates are still historically low. And we need to remind that everybody that the historical average like 30 year fixed mortgage rate is 8%. And however, rates are significantly, of course, they are significantly higher than the previous years, uh, the previous year, about like three percentage point, like more. Uh, so it affects, of course, the the, uh, the households and the home buyers. As a result, what we see is that the monthly mortgage payment is about sixty percent higher compared to last year. So specifically, in the New York metro area, the monthly mortgage payment rose about like uh, to about like 3400 uh, 3, from uh, 2100 like the previous year so about like 1300 so buyers now current buyers need to spend about like uh, 1300 more every month for the long period uh, for the next like for example like 30 years while uh, compared to those who bought like their house like purchased their house like the previous year um 
while borrowing costs have like increased faster than people's wages, like buyers currently need to spend about like 10% like more of the budget for their mortgage payment if they want to buy the median price home. Um, However, not all of them can do that. Like um, already uh, some of the households of the, they're like already burdened. So uh, they cannot like straight out like more than budget. So we see that about 1.4 million households um, ha have been priced out in the New York metro area compared to a year ago. So these households were able to afford to buy the, med the median priced home like in the area uh, last year, but not anymore because uh, the, the qualifying income has increased like significantly. So with, uh, with these rates and home prices like hurting affordability and making like even more, more difficult uh, for some buyers to afford to buy a home, we see that housing market is slowing down in 2022. And actually, this is a good thing. This is what we wanted to see, like a healthier and more predictable like, real estate ma market. Like have in mind that in 2021, uh, 2021 was the best year for the housing market in the last like 15 years, like since uh, 2006, like home purchase like surged over the past year, like in a normal way. Uh, even though like home prices hit record highs, like eroding affordability, housing market outperformed. Thus, nationwide um, home sales will continue to slow down. This is what we expect, uh, but maybe to stabilize as uh, rates may also like um, uh, rise at a slower like uh, pace. Uh, will stabilize like soon. So, in fact, like home sales dropped uh, for the last seven straight months, uh, which is considered as like a housing recession. Like uh, when when sales drop, like for example, for six straight months this considered as the start of the recession. And now we have like for seven months. However, I would like to point out that this is a slowdown in the home sales, uh, but not a recession in home prices, like home prices. And I I will talk a little like further like in the next slide um, about the prices. We see that they continue to, to increase uh, very fast. Uh, thus for 2022, we expect like home sales uh, to drop about 13%, 14% uh, compared to last year as like demand uh, is cooling down. And to give you an idea, we expect about 5.3 like million homes to be sold like in 2022. Um, so let's see now what's going on with home prices. Like um, although these higher mortgage rates hurt affordability, we see that home prices continue to, in, to, to rise, to increase. Normally, we expect uh, higher mortgage rates to cool off prices, but actually, I don't expect home prices to drop in 2022. Uh, we will see, of course, like, uh, and this is what we see, a, a slower home price appreciation, but not a price drop. Like, in fact, data shows uh, we released it like yesterday that home prices rose about like 8%, 7.7% like in August, although mortgage rates uh, were rising. Um, in fact, it's the second like straight month that home prices rose by a single digit like a uh, number compared to the previous month. So that's, there is, this is what we see, there is a gradual uh, acceleration of home prices, but we don't have a price drop. Then also looking back in history is something that we do just to get an idea of what to expect. Um, looking back like in history, uh, like back in 1979, home prices like didn't fall uh, when mortgage rates and inflation were also like rising, neither like in 1982, when mortgage rates reached like 18%. Uh, specifically, home prices rose about like 5% on average between 1980 and 1982. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we should bear in mind that mortgage rates like an inflation uh, were much higher then in the 80s uh, than they're not, like now. Um, nevertheless, mortgage rates are currently like historically low, like below 8%. Um, meanwhile, I expect uh, the impact of these like rising mortgage rates to be even smaller than back in the 80s. Um, as there is also a severe like housing shortage. When there is a housing shortage, 
prices usually don't drop. We don't expect like home prices to increase. So uh, you, you, cannot you cannot have like price drops when there is like not enough like supply out there. So uh, all in all, like we, we expect home prices to increase about like 12% uh, in 2022. So still like a double digit appreciation like on average for the year. But I would also like to, uh, to mention something that we hear again and again that Okay, home prices hurt significantly affordability, and this is true. Like they, they increase the borrowing cost. Uh, indeed, what we see is that the median priced home uh, is worth about forty thousand, like more than a year earlier. But while both uh, home prices and mortgage rates like increase uh, the borrowing cost for prospective um, buyers, the impact of higher mortgage rates is actually three times larger on the monthly payment uh, than that of home prices. Like specifically within the tw last 12 months, all else equal, like if everything else was equal, we see that the monthly mortgage payment rose by about like $500, 510 like uh, due uh, to the increase uh, of mortgage rates. However, higher Home prices pro pushed up the mortgage rates by about like one hundred and fifty dollars. So it seems that a one percent that point like increase in mortgage rates has the same impact of uh, on the mortgage payment if as if like home prices rise by thirteen percent. So this is how we see that we see that the impact of the uh, rising mortgage rates is uh, significantly like about three times like larger than that of the home prices. Um, uh, so we see that demand is slowing down due to these higher like rates, but let's see now how other factors like, or I will say uh, better like trends could affect the housing market. So let's talk about uh, some demographic like trends in the area. But what are the demographics? Like demographics are data uh, that describes like the, the composition like of a population, um, like such as like age, uh, race, gender, uh, income, uh, migration patterns, and uh, population like growth. Um, these statistics mostly affect like how real estate like market is priced and what types likely like um, of properties are in demand. Um, major shifts in demographics like of a nation uh, can have a, a large impact uh, on real estate like trends for several decades and not for in the near term only. So first of all, we see that there is, um, uh, let's go like at local level like, and what we see like uh, the demographic like, trends there like in the New York metro area. So first of all, we see that there is a slower household growth in the area compared to nationwide uh, in the last decade. Um, specifically, according to the just release, like uh, data, uh, census data, the 2021 estimate for, of the American Community Survey, the, the number of households in the New York metro area rose by 6% compared to 7% nationwide. When we compare uh, uh, the, the figures for 2021 and the figures for 2011, uh, about specifically about 500,000 like new households were added in the last like decade. Uh, however, as you know, better than anyone else. So we have, and this is what we say, we have like a little like slower uh, household um, growth uh, in the area. Um, however, as you know, better than anyone else, all real estate is local. And so when we take a look uh, at the county level data, we see that, um, that the household growth is faster uh, in Queens, uh, Kings, and New York like, counties, like about like uh, above like eight percent, like eight point five in Queens, like uh, in Kings, like eight point five in New York, eight point three. So this can also mean that demand for housing may uh, be expected to be even like higher in these uh, counties as like population changes, like or specifically like increases, uh, also mean. Uh, a higher like demand for housing. Um, then when we um, when we compare population between 2020 and 2021, so in the last, uh, within a year, we get that the New York metro area had the fifth largest um, uh, annual population like decline. Uh, 
so this area had ha, had lost like about 330,000 like people within a year. Uh, in fact, uh, that was uh, the largest uh, annual and cumulative like numer numeric like population like decline like, across the country. Uh, so we see that <coughs> excuse me that population has dropped in the past like year, but this is not a local issue like nationwide population growth has been like slowing for years like because of lower birth rates decreasing like net international uh, migration and aging population uh, indeed what we see is that parsing out by age um, because it's very important to explain why population like dropped in the area what we get is that population for population under five years old uh, th that age group like experienced the largest like losses while older population like grows by nearly like two percent so indeed what we see is that this drop is uh, because of uh, less uh, birth and uh, the aging like population that we see then we also see that um domestic uh domestic uh, migration is also me, uh, is also declining uh, in the New York metro area, affecting uh, population like changes in the area, in this area. Um, in fact, New York's decline population in the last year was mostly attributed like to uh, negative domestic migration, uh, while many of workers like continue to work remotely after comparing the number of people like moving in the area compared to those who moved out we see that uh, that net migration was about like uh, uh, lower, like 300, like minus 380,000 like people. And so this means that about like uh, 380,000, like more people left than those who moved in. Um, and with net migration, we mean exactly like this, like how many they moved in with those who moved out. So in 2020, the net migration I included here in the slide was 55,000, like negative again. However, we see like more people like uh, moving out uh, from uh, uh, in 2021 in this area. Um, nevertheless, I would like to uh, mention that the data also shows that uh, more people are returning to big cities such as like New York and um, Indeed, based on the USPS data, uh, that we can have like more uh, recent like data for 2022, for example, uh, the share of inbound moves in the New York metro area was like 47 percent, like in 2021, uh, 2022, as of like August, like from January to August. What does this mean? Like, consider that a share below 50 percent means that this area experienced like migration losses. So more people left so although the new york uh, metro area continues to experience like migration uh, losses we see that more people are coming back uh, since like the share uh, of uh, inbound moves uh, was like 47 as i mentioned in 2021 however in 2020 uh, in 2022 uh, however in 2021 was 44 percent so Back in 2021, we had like more people leaving, even more. But now we see that this share like increases and hopefully will be like above the 50%, which means that it gains like my uh, movers, like it gains like more people like uh, moving in the area. Um, but um, let's talk a little bit about now about a factor that that boosting. Uh, boosting like housing demand and we continue to do that i think uh, which is like a teleworking um uh, for a national level as as we saw uh so two years into the pandemic and uh, the ma majority of uh, workers with jobs that can be done like from home are still teleworking um census data uh, shows that the number of people primarily um, working from home tripled between 2019, so pre-pandemic, and 2021. This is the, the latest data we can have, like the 2021. And actually, in the New York metro area, uh, the number of re remote workers uh, is five times larger in 2021 compared to 2019. Uh, in the meantime, it's interesting to see that millennials uh, or young professionals are the ones that resist more. I came across with a, a study that, uh, in a survey that it shows that about 
71% of 18 to 24 years old um, uh, said that they will consider to uh, looking for another like job if their company insisted on them like returning to the office like full time compared to we see like the share this dropped at 61 percent again for the young the 18 to 24 was about like 71 percent for 35 to 44 is like 61 percent and for ages like uh, 45 54 it drops like to uh, below 60 like at 56 percent uh, so we see that uh, millennials, young people are the ones like resisting more going back to the office. But how teleworking like is affecting the real estate market with, um, and we have evidence now with the data, like with teleworking reaching all time highs, like during the pandemic, we saw many people like living from big cities. This is what we saw like centers and uh, moving to suburbs and uh, smaller cities. Uh, while people move for various reasons, some of them uh, were looking like for bigger homes, uh, since uh, uh, for, with like bigger yards, bigger uh, bigger yards for the kids like to play, or for them like an office space dedicated like for them to work. Others were looking like for more affordable um, homes in less dense areas, since uh, places away from large city centers, since they can telework. Um, indeed, according to our home buyers and service, uh, sellers uh, survey, the size of the purchased homes increased in 2021 compared to 2019. Uh, that the pandemic like has reshaped like uh, where we live um, with like workers like no longer and like uh, expect to show up like in person, like at least not daily, where they choose to live will continue to change like as we see like a persistent like urban rural migration. However, uh, what we see is teleworking may continue like push down like the population. However, we see like more people are coming back to the air as well as many like uh, employers are asking like from the employees to come back. And we see that with the data from the uh, USPS. Um, but I included here like a little bit like to get an idea of where these people move to, uh, like where are New Yorkers like are moving to. Uh, unfortunately, there, is, there isn't any data for 2022 uh, that provides us information about the migration flows, like where, like where people move to and from where. However, I took a look at the IRS uh, data uh, for 2020, and I see that most New Yorkers like usually move to New Jersey, about like 18% of them, uh, to Florida for outstate, like uh, out of the state, like um, uh, moved uh, to Florida about 15% and Pennsylvania respectively like New York is like popular like destination like uh, New York State uh, is popular destination for people uh, who live like in uh, New Jersey again like very close um, or Florida or from California so we see that about like New Jersey 16% of those who moved in um, uh, they were like from New Jersey about 12 percent they were like from Florida and about like nine percent like from California um what but why this this uh, people like move uh, move out like from New York metro area and the answer like is very easy like uh, due to affordability uh, people since people cannot afford to buy a home in the area, they decide, and this is what we see that like many of them decide to move to a more affordable area. So that's the reason I wanted to give you like an idea and compare the affordability conditions by income level in the area, New York metro area and nationwide. Uh, while the media like uh, home price uh, in the area is like higher than the national level, we see that buyers can afford to buy a smaller share of listings like in the New York metro area, the nationwide. Specifically, home buyers need to uh, earn more than $200,000 in order to be able to afford to buy half of 50% of the listings in the New York metro area. Um, nationwide, as you can see here in the in the chat, like these uh, buyers can afford to buy three out of four homes, like um, which are like available uh, for sale. So while they can afford to buy by like fifty percent, like forty eight percent, we see that the same these same buyers can afford to buy in most of the places uh, across the country about like seventy five percent of the homes. Um, uh, so uh, th th this is what we see, and um, 
uh, it's very important like to, uh, to understand how um why like people move out like due to uh, these uh, affordability issues um in the meantime apart from affordability we also need to think of about availability of homes since we have like a severe housing shortage uh, in uh, inventory like continues to be near record lows like uh, pushing home prices <coughs> and making the market like uh, competitive uh, our country like is suffering like from a severe housing shortage so let's compare now the availability of homes that the buyers at uh, different income levels can afford to buy now compared to uh, the beginning of the year when mortgage rates were like about like three percentage points like lower like they were about like the three three point two now they're like six point like three and what do we see uh, in a nutshell uh, we see that inventory is rising which translates to more listings available uh, in the market however it's very interesting to see that the buyers in the new york metro area need to earn more than $150,000 in order to afford to buy most of these additional homes. Like for example, in January 2022, there were about like 70, uh, there, there were about like 7,400 like homes available for sale for buyers earning $100,000. How, however, as of June 2022 that we have the data, there are fewer like uh, homes uh, for this like that they can afford to buy. These income uh, buyers of this income level can afford to buy. There are actually about like eight hundred fewer listings. In contrast, uh, for buyers earning like one hundred fifty thousand dollars, we see that there are about five hundred seven hundred uh, more listings now compared to the beginning of the year. Even though. Um, home buying is more expensive even though uh, their affordability like de uh, decreased that we see that for these upper income like buyers there are like more homes available for sale even though affordability is lower than in the beginning of the year when uh, both like home prices were like lower and mortgage rates were lower so although it's promising to see all this like um, additional inventory that inventory is rising more entry level, like uh, and at the median, like uh, price range, need to be added to the market in order to to have like more people to purchase like a home. Um, but let's go now and compare uh, the typical renter with the recent buyer, like in order to get an idea of how many of the current renters in the New York metro area uh, will be able to make the transition from rentership to homeownership. Because this is what we all uh, want to know, like how many renters will be able to become homeowners in order to boost like a uh, homeownership rate as well. So we estimated that there are about like 3.70 uh, for 3.5 like million households that there are still like renting in the area, in the metro area. And they spend about like six, uh, 1,600 like on average for their rent. What actually drew my attention was that even though renters are older than recent buyers, renters earn uh, about like 50 uh, less than 55 like thousand dollars however according to the data people need to have an income of about one hundred thirty thousand dollars if they want to uh, to become like homeowners in the area specifically what we see is that only 18 percent of so less than 20 percent of the renters have that income and the main reason that we see that is like uh, renters have a uh, low income is because First of all, we see like most of them have lower, um, have uh, less education, like lower than a bachelor like degree. Only like 39%, so less than 40% of the renters in the New York metro area had a, a bachelor degree uh, and higher. Uh, and as you know, like income usually increases like uh, with education, like I think, like uh, moreover. Uh, so this is what we expect, as you can see, like about 62% of the home buyers have a bachelor degree and higher indication. Also, what uh, we see uh, as well is that married households usually typically have a higher like household income and more financial uh, assets, uh, which strengthens their uh, underwriting criteria. However, only 30%, like one in three uh, 
out of three like uh, renters are married compared to about like 55 percent uh, for home buyers thus rising mortgage rates may take it, may make it like even harder for these like renters to uh, become homeowners so we see that they have like fewer of them have the education that can help them to have like a higher income or like they're, they're like uh, substantially like um, fewer of them are, are married. Finally, um, uh, let's, uh, let's take a look at the construction. Um, and the good news is that what we see in the area is that more single family and multifamily permits uh, are currently like issued compared to last year and compared to pre-pandemic, like in 2019. Like for example, uh, in July 2022, about 1,200 like single family uh, homes were permitted compared to 1,000 like back in 2019. And then about multifamily uh, with five and plus like units in July 22 uh, were issued about like 3,900 uh, compared to 32 like 100 uh, that we had like uh, uh, in 2019. So it seems that builders still see profit like opportunities even uh, as they uh, concede like uh, on prices like material prices uh, including that of lumber uh, have been like moderating and fully like completely like homes are selling like fast. Um, uh, so we should expect like more multifamily and uh, homes to become like uh, available to the market uh, in the near future and single family. So this is good news to have like more inventory expected uh, for um, for the upcoming like months. Uh, so in a nutshell, this is um, uh, the trends that I was able to identify that for the area and what we should like expect like uh, uh, for the upcoming months like nationwide and in the area. And I will be happy to answer any questions if you have. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Nadia, so much. And I will start, uh, stop sharing my screen. Oh, yeah, you stopped. <laughs> Thank you, Nadia. Thank you. So, At this point, I'd like to introduce our moderator, uh, Roseanne Pagiotta, Associate Broker with Houlihan Lawrence, who will briefly introduce our panelists. Roseanne? Good morning. Thank you. Um, okay. I'd like to uh, start with Joe Rand, and perhaps you could um, say a little bit about yourself. Thank you. <coughs> Sure, thank you, uh, Roseanne, and thanks everybody for having me here. Uh, my appreciation to be involved, and um, uh, thank you for that very, uh, very helpful and informative presentation. Um, the my, my name is Joe Rand. I'm the Chief Creative Officer of Howard Hanna Rand Realty. I also do some industry consulting and uh, writing and uh, speaking. Uh, and I've for about 20 years, I've done the analysis every quarter for the companies. Uh, market reports. So I've been watching the housing market in our region pretty closely for almost 20 years. Thank you. Uh, Gabriel Pasquale. Can you unmute, Gabe? Thanks. Good morning, um, Nadia. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, so robust and full of information. I don't know how we can retop that. Um, my name is Gabe Pasquale. I am the um, senior, senior Vice President of New Development for Christie's um, in Westchester in New Jersey. I've uh, been in the business for longer than I want to express uh, and um, mainly focused on uh, new development opportunities for our company as well as growth and expansion for Christie's International Real Estate. Um, in New Jersey, um, Westchester, Rockland, Orange, and all of the world beyond that. And I will turn it over back to you, Roseanne. Thank you. And now Jonathan Miller, please. Uh, sure. Uh, first of all, uh, like everyone is saying, Nadia, I got a lot out of that. That was really, really helpful. I appreciate it. Um, uh, I am Jonathan Miller. Uh, co-founder, president, and CEO of Miller Samuel. It's a real estate appraisal and consulting firm uh, based in New York City that is about 38 years old. And uh, we uh, do res primarily residential appraisers and appraisals in the New York metro area, including Westchester. Um, and I'm also the author of uh, Douglas Solomon's Market Report series 
since 1994, covering about 40 different housing markets across the U.S. They're used by many financial institutions, including the Fed and the Alphabet Soup of Washington uh, acronyms. Uh, and I teach market analysis at Columbia University every summer. Uh, so, uh, and I know some pretty good dad jokes. So I'm uh, ready to go. Wonderful, thank you. And Trevetti. Good morning, thank you, Hagar, for the invitation and Nadia for the lovely presentation. Uh, my name is Chintan Trivedi. I'm a broker owner of a real estate company called Remax in the city. I also have a other business interest in sports and recreation, and I'm an investor and a developer. Thank you. Okay, so we will start with our questions. In a recent real estate and financial experts panel held on September 7th, titled Economic Outlook and Forecasting the New York Region, the panelists concurred that we would be seeing a recession in 2023. What is your forecast for the real estate industry in our region for the next six to 12 months? Joe? Um, I, you know, my sense, uh, when I've looked at the data of what's actually happening in the Hudson Valley, um, the market is clearly slowed from, I mean, dramatically slowed from 2021 and 2020. Um, but that's like comparing, you know, a home run total the year after you set the record to like, oh, I hit 60, you know, what Mike Judge next year will hit 45 home runs. Um, and not Mike Judge, uh, uh, Aaron Judge <laughs> will hit, uh, Mike Judge is a, is a Beavis and Butthead. <laughs> Beavis and Butthead guy. <laughs> so Aaron, off to a good start, Joe. Aaron Judge uh, will hit 60 something home runs this year. Next year he'll hit 45 and he'll be down by 25%. And it will be will it be considered to be a bad year we're down from last year last year was a record we're down from 2020 that was a record um i looked and i made a comparison i just did the analysis lot yesterday for the third quarter to date um of sales compared to 19 and 18 2019 2018 which at the time were considered pretty robust markets um and in westchester the sales are up two percent from 19 four percent from 18 um, in Rockland, the sales are flat from 19, but up 6% from 18. They're down in orange, but part of that might be the fact that orange average sales price is up 50% from two or three years ago. So they might just have an inventory problem, and, and as Nadia pointed out, an affordability problem there. Uh, do I think the market's going to continue to slow? Yes. Um, I, I think it's going to look like the 18 market or the 17 market in terms of sales figures. But we're going to be talking about 17 sales figures in 2022 pricing, which is 30 to 40 percent higher. Um, so it's a, it's still from a volume standpoint, still pretty strong. As to whether there's going to be a recession, I have no idea. I don't. It's not my not my uh, my my uh, forte or my strong strong suit to economic stuff. The housing stuff, though, in terms of local, I think it's going to slow, but I think it's going to be a measured pace uh, and nothing like what we saw you know, 15 years ago when the market or 14 years ago when the market really did go through a dramatic decline, which was precipitated by financial problems. Thank you. Jonathan, do you have something to add or a different perspective? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, I always have something to add. Uh, the, uh, first of all, the disclaimer, and I said on our pre-call that um, my crystal balls held together with duct tape. And so, you know, um, just like Joe was saying, there's really no way uh, to sort of predict accurately whether we, we have an, a recession coming. Some would say that we're already in a recession, um, uh, and it depends how how uh, you know how deep uh, or how long the Fed continues to raise rates to try to take a baseball to bat to the economy to to <laughs> cause higher unemployment. I mean, that's really the goal of the Fed action. Um, I think what's really interesting is that uh, the whole idea of this is to beat down inflation. But when the Fed measures inflation, 30% uh, of the housing market is part of inflation. And uh, clearly, the sales activity has come down, uh, you know, and, and the momentum has been sort of taken out of the market. Uh, because of the doubling of mortgage rates since the end of December from low threes to low sixes. 
uh, that's that's a massive change. Um, but uh, what it's actually doing is also pushing people into the rental market. And the housing component of inflation is actually measured by the owner's equivalent rent. So I'm sort of confused about how, you know, if rate uh, increases, especially on the scale of 75 basis points each time to slow down the market, it's actually keeping rents higher. Uh, it seems to be sort of, uh, you know, um, a circular reference. Um, so I think there's a lot of unknown. And that actually is the the biggest headwind facing housing right now is uncertainty. I, I'm pretty confident that if we saw rate increases stop tomorrow, that we would see a rebound of some activity. Clearly, like Joe said, nothing like what we saw in, in uh uh, during the call it the pandemic era, but clearly um, a change in a change in confidence. Thank you. Um, since you are speaking about rentals, uh, a great number of rental properties are being built now, more so than in the past. Why is the rental market being developed, and who do you feel they are attracting? Also, there are in other areas not necessarily in our metropolitan area, single family rental communities being developed. Do you foresee a market for those in our area as well? And we'll start with Gabe. Um, I definitely, just the tail end of the question, uh, Roseanne, I definitely think that on a national level, we are going to see the opportunity of more um, new single family rental communities. It's not something that really has parlayed yet in the Northeast. Um, I think developers are definitely doing their due diligence now. I know there are some acquisitions in process. I think that will become an opportunistic market from a new development perspective, but I think it also will give um, especially millennials a new opportunity with regards to how they live and where they wanna live um, in a rental scenario. And I think there's a, a, a huge psychographic here in how the demographics are changing. And as we move into this next marketplace, which I think we can all say is not really clear, there's not real strong visibility here with regards to what's gonna happen. But I do believe that a lot of millennials that are looking to sort of uh, change their um, urban lifestyle to a somewhat suburban lifestyle without buying, it will be a very robust market. I also think for empty nesters who don't necessarily want to leave the marketplace, but want to capitalize on today's current pricing, as long as it holds, they will also jump into that market as well um, because they want to be closer to their family and grandchildren and they don't necessarily want to buy, or there isn't the right housing stock for them to purchase. Um, as it relates to the rental market overall, I continue to shake my head at the numbers and not understanding, especially even where today's interest rates are, why people are willing to pay, you know, 18 to 2200 for a one bedroom apartment in White Plains. But there's no inventory. The market's at about 94% occupancy. Um, you know, none of the REITs or major landlords in the metro cities are really crying. They're giving a little bit of incentive, maybe a month's rent, maybe two months rent, but you're not seeing big incentives. So I think people, a lot of people have gotten priced out of the market just based on income and affordability. So they're continuing to rent because they can't save. And if they don't have parent pocket to help them buy, they're out of the market. I, I can just add to that, Roseanne, yeah. if you don't mind. No, um, I'll jump in. We, ju we just, uh, uh, today, we just published our Douglas Solomon uh, rental report for August. And um, the, it, for the first time after six months of median rent being at all time records, uh it it hiccuped a little bit um we saw uh now rents are only the second highest in history instead of the highest in history uh but we and i think um the takeaway from this and sort of what gabriel's talking about like 
um, you know, there's this incredible demand. Um, we are seeing some cracks uh, in, in that growth. However, uh, it's only one month, you know, and sort of, you know, three data points make a trend, uh, sort of uh, the way to look at it. But it does suggest that uh, rents are starting to plateau. The problem that consumers and perhaps the brokerage industry, I think, will have with interpreting this is this idea that, well, when rents stop rising, they start falling. And um, I think the opposite of rising rents is stabilizing rents. It's not falling rents. And um, uh, without some sort of recession um, to drive unemployment higher, I it's hard to imagine rents coming down significantly to be a lot more affordable. That's the way I would look at it. And then the other thing that's been pretty clear is that with rising mortgage rates, uh, and I alluded to this earlier, uh, that's pushing people into the rental market that are priced out and the rental market's already tight. So it's making a tight market, you know, tighter, uh, more or less. And, um, and that's, that, that's a challenge for, for the market. I think the rent to own, as Gabriel was talking about, I think that's a big, big new growth sector, but that's more nationally and not as much in the Northeast as uh, we're seeing out West or, you know, in this, in the Sun Belt states. Thank you. Chinton, do you have something you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I think the rental market will uh, continue to stay robust, if not uh, stay where it is for next uh, year or two, at least 15 months to 18 months, because a lot of millennials are making a decision to just wait on the sideline to see where this market cools off, how it's going to cool off. And uh, people, you know, with the pandemic, I think psychologically they're making choices about uh, should we be committed to 30 year mortgage? And a, and a one area and a one home. You know, with the global lifestyle, people can work from anywhere and everywhere um, and able to achieve uh, uh, production success. Uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, until, until the intervention of Fed or inventory increasing, I think the buyer pool will probably stay on the sideline and rent. You know, I'm seeing a lot of activity on people renting in where our marketplace, I'm seeing rents uh, between three and four thousand dollars for two bedrooms, and people are gladly paying and competing for it. So uh, you know they are th they are thinking instead of paying a mortgage, I can commit for a year or two in a lease and see where this takes us. Nothing goes up forever, and if the market cools off or the rate comes down, and I have a better inventory to pick from, we'll participate in the purchase market. So. I think it will stay there. You know, uh, it, it may not keep increasing, but it will stay there. Thank you. Okay, there was a major shift in doing business during the pandemic. How do you see our community shifting now that things are becoming less restrictive? Do you see any major changes in real estate on the horizon? Joe? Uh, you mean in terms of real estate practice, the way people practice? Um, yes. Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, listen, I am extraordinarily proud of the industry, not just my agents, though I'm proud of my agents, but I'm really proud of how the industry overall recovered from it, the practitioners uh, recovered from the COVID challenges that, you know, at a time when it was illegal, literally illegal to leave your right. home and go show right. a property, we still managed to sell about half as many properties in April and May of 2020 as we did in April and May of 2019. Um, I don't know how that happened, but it happened. And at the time, as I'm like, sort of like, you know, planning my meals with, uh, you know, a, all right, I'm gonna have tuna for every dinner between, you know, Monday and Friday, as I was thinking we had to batten down every hatch, uh, homes kept selling and and that was astonishing to me. And, and so kudos to everybody who found ways to get homes sold. Kudos to the attorneys that set up closing tables in their front lawns uh, outside their 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 buildings um, and getting all that stuff done. I don't know that it feels to me like it snapped back. Like we did do some innovative things during COVID, like virtual showings. Like we would, you know, you take your phone and you'd walk somebody through the house, and here's and they'd be home watching because they didn't want to go and actually visit the home. 
Um, and that seems to have subsided. Like, it's not like we kept that up, um, which it would have been interesting if we had. Um, so I don't know that there's anything dramatically changing. I will tell you that we're going to need to adapt for the obvious reason that there are agents in this business, if they've been in business for the last, you know, just the last three to four years, and the ones who have been in the business longer, but you, you know, you get into certain habits, you know, listing periods that last longer than three weeks, um, you have to build the skills to maintain a relationship with a seller for a three to six month period, because homes are going to take longer to sell, which means that you need something to say to the seller after a month when the home hasn't sold. And a lot of you haven't had to do that um, in a long time. Um, and that's the and, and it's that kind of stuff that you have to adapt to that, how that changing um, the changing model if homes are gonna take longer to sell deals might be a little tougher buyers have to be able to be a little more adept with their financing. Um, and that's the kind of stuff I think that agents will have to adapt to change to uh, continue to be effective in this market. Thank you. Um, I'll open it to any one of the other three of you if you have something that you would like to. I, I'd well, like to add to that. I, um, go ahead, sorry. Um, I I do see the the lead market changing. The way the leads are are used to come. Uh, you know, fifteen years ago, ten years ago, even five years ago, with Zillow, New Agent, Seller Leads, um, and a lot of these companies have mastered the online inquiry and interest and capturing those interests and transferring into lead for themselves and selling them through their networks. And I think the you know agents who are experienced and have a good book of business and referral business are less affected by it, but the agents who are in the middle or younger agents uh, who need to survive in the industry, um, uh, their options are getting limited. You know, the, uh, they, they, I have to depend on Zillow or such engines to provide them buyer or seller leads to be able to survive and, and, and immediately start a partnership of expense, which is greater than most brokerages usually offer. So I think uh, it is going to continue. They're going to continue to increase the market share of how many leads they take away from the traditional system and, and, and do it. So I think that model is here to stay is luckily, you know, is going to take a time, you know, with pandemic and all these things. So. I think we need to learn to have that uh, elephant in the room address one day more clearly than now. But <laughs> I think they're, they're definitely capturing slowly and eating away the pie the way it used to be five years or 10 years ago. Right, thank you so much. Uh, I, I'll just add, um, I'm a real estate appraiser and market analyst, I'm not a broker. Although to qualify uh, for this conversation, I was a broker for six months in 1985, became a before I became an appraiser, so I feel eminently qualified. Uh, uh, but uh, just just a thought, and this is more about the condition that the brokerage world finds itself in, um, and and especially to uh, to Joe's point about you know people, some people that are relatively new to the industry haven't gone through a you know a, a weaker period, you know, uh, uh, more challenging, and just. Just to highlight how it's different, um, uh, if you look at August uh, new inventory for single families in Westchester compared to pre-pandemic, they're down 56 percent. Uh, there, there is a lot less product coming into the market because of uncertainty, and the brokerage community lives and dies by whether you know adequate inventory to be able to sell. So I think. The big change going forward, at least over the next year or so, until the Fed changes or reduces this uncertainty about the future, is to to learn how to cultivate and bring list inventory into the market. I think it's sort of an unprecedented period where you you tend to expect inventory to, to balloon when sales slow, and what we're seeing is just the opposite. In some markets, we're seeing inventory uh, essentially correct. You know what one of the um, interesting uh, challenges I think we're going to face that we've never faced before, at least not in my lifetime, uh, or not in my life, in my career, 20 something years, is we have not really 
in 30 to 40 years, we have not lived through a rising rate environment. Um, it has been a declining rate environment for really about 25 years. I mean, it, it kind of bounced around again, but you go back to the mid nineties and since then rates were at historical lows and they hit new historical lows and they had even newer historical lows and lower and lower and lower. And now all of a sudden seven months or nine months in to rates going up. And mm -hmm. that is, that has a couple of, I mean, that, that has, we can't necessarily predict how that's going to affect um sales we we obviously think okay we'll affect buyers because buyers can stretch less but i think one of the things i'm really concerned about from a longer term perspective is the seller who can't afford to sell that and i'll give you just a personal example i have a vacation home down in point pleasant beach i refinanced that three years ago to 2.75 percent or something like that i would like to and i could afford to get a house closer to the beach my house is a little far from the beach. I get a closer home. I could afford to spend more because I'll get more from my home. I'll sell it for more. And then I could buy the nicer, closer home. But my payment would go up dramatically. Even, you know, forget the price change. It's just that I go from my 2.75% to 5, 6%, 7%, whatever it's going to be. Take that and take all the people in Westchester County, take all the people in Manhattan who either refinanced or bought in the last seven or eight years and have a sub 4% rate that if they want to move up and moving up you in the last 25 years, moving up has meant you're going to spend more for your home, but you might actually get a similar or lower rate on your home. They are, it's like the golden handcuffs. They've got golden handcuffs. They got exactly. a rate that is so good that they can't give up that home. And that's going to stifle some inventory for a while, as long as Jonathan says, like you say, until rates get down to a, so there's not that much of a delta between the old rate and the new rate. Um, and that's going to be a little bit of a problem, I think, for a lot of us is, is uh, finding creative ways for sellers to be able to afford to sell. And Joe, to, Joe to, piv to pivot on that, um, I think there's also a very big market, especially in the suburban communities in and around Manhattan, where there are a lot of um, home buyers that took adjustable rate mortgages eight and 10 years ago, and those adjustable rates only went down. So they may have taken an eight and a half, and that went down to a two, and now it's up to a five. Um, and now where do they go? Because they can't trade the same house for the same price. Right. So I think that buyer also has a challenge. And I think that's potentially some new inventory that's going to come onto the market because these buyers are going to feel like they're going in the wrong direction. Or I should say these owners are going to feel like they're going in the wrong direction because they're continuing to rate correct, you know, every, you know, every year now. Right. If they're on like a LIBOR plus or something like that. Co rate, correct. Yeah, they probably have. They're going up two floating. points. If you had a rate that was floating over the last 20 years and just a pure float off the, a fixed rate from, you were, you did great. You, you loved it. It was wonderful. I do think with the, the one thing about, about that though, is that, and the reason, like when people say, oh, my God, are we looking at 2008 again? And I just want to remind people, no. 2008 was precipitated no. by a whole bunch of crazy things, including the fact that people who bought from 2005 to 2008, those three years were disproportionately adjustable rate mortgages and like really funky adjustable rate mortgages, mortgages that were going to reset after one year, mortgages that were negative amortization for the first year, you know, stuff like that, that was that allowed people who had no business buying a home to buy a home. And so right. then after rates went up and prices went down in 2008, we had the massive foreclosure pr uh, problem. We're not going to have that this year for two reasons. One is basically almost everybody in the last five years who got a house bought a fixed rate mortgage, got a fixed rate mortgage. There just wasn't a lot of adjustables because you didn't need to. You could get a 30 year fix for 2.75 or a seven year adjustable 2.4. Why would you get the adjustable? Why not just lock yourself in for 30 years, as I was referencing before? And so as a result, we're not, we don't have a foreclosure. There's not going to be a foreclosure boom. And people, that's what caused all yeah. the problems in 2009. You're not going to have a foreclosure boom. Prices are up 30%, 40% from two years ago. Those people can just yeah, sell their houses if they have to get out. Right. They have record home equity. Um, yeah. Just to sort of uh, jump on top of that is I think one 
thing to be very cognizant of is that lenders during this pandemic era boom did not lose their mind and uh and mortgage underwriting conditions relative to the three decades prior to the housing bubble uh were more conservative so we're not looking at a banking crisis on the other side of this uh, or you know which would have massive implications for the economy um and you know in a in a strange way you know all of us could see this coming during the pandemic boom you know that this is not forever and it's not sustainable. I mean, I can tell you, you know, in housing markets, like in Southern California, I covered 65% of the transactions were bidding wars uh, in the second quarter. Um, and it's gonna be, there's still bidding wars now, but it's gonna be a fraction of what it was. Westchester, Fairfield were, you know, roughly half of the transactions were bidding wars in the second quarter. That's not gonna continue. And I think that's a good thing um, in terms of stability, because that, you know, ends up becoming a scary, uh, you know, situation for buyers that are dipping their toe into the market. Um, this is sort of more of a grown up or stabilized housing market going forward, I think. I think yeah. Yeah, it's like a pause before play kind of a market, you know, it's going to be slow, but I think the spring of 2023 election year. Uh, economy has to be better most of the time. If you look at historically, the election year usually drives better economic policy, is an uh, uh, easy environment to purchase. You know, they want to make American dream possible for most homeowners. You can already see in some markets, Bank of America, and they are coming with the creative products again to encourage home buying. So mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, the sauce is brewing for success. Uh, but there'll be a little pause before play. Thank you very much. All answered my next question. <laughs> we're forecasting. We're using our crystal ball, anticipating what you're going to There you ask. go. <laughs> um, do you continue to see migration away from cities or are people seeking to move back? Are buyers making their decisions primarily by choice or necessity? What is driving this shift? I do see it actually reverse. Um, uh, when there was a migration out of New York City, people thought the city is dead. And it took four months before it got filled again. You know, people from out of other states who had a dream to have a place in New York, they're buying it. I sold homes, more homes to people who lived outside New York, into New York City than ever. Um, uh, prices were not affordable before pandemic allow for a little pause in affordability for people and the rates and all that stuff. So um, I think there is always uh, somebody else fits the chair and has uh, the dream of being in New York and New York market. Uh, it is a hard place to live, you know, as our Nadia mentioned, you know, migration, people and New York uh, statistics. But uh, um, there are, I think the, the dream of a big city, New York's luster, sometimes gets a scratch, but never loses the full face of it, you know? So I think there, there'll be a filler, the people who may live for different reasons, you know, Upper East Side and different reasons for wealth tax and, you know, the loopholes being uh, tight enough for the state transfers. But but there are people who are moving in, you know, like Google, uh, there are companies who are hiring, uh, people from all over the country are coming here. And I looked at the migration report, uh, immigration report. The last 20 years after 9-11, 2002 to 2022, has the highest migration of people into America in any last 300 years since independence. Last 20 years has been the most people migrated to America from all over the world. And simple reasons, you know, better quality of life, uh, law, opportunities. And I think it will continue. You know, immigration has been tough. Um, they're not allowing as many visas and stuff like that, but still legal immigration and migration has been highest into America. So I think the housing is here to stay as a key driver for, uh, you know, for years to come. Uh, I, I just to, to add is, um, so, uh, I think that the immigration story is not finished because the data lag is pretty severe. Um, you know, they're they're you know as as Nadi was saying earlier, it's clearly a, a net loss, but we're seeing 
Bloomberg just reported that there was a net gain of 50,000 people during the pandemic into Connecticut. Um, I don't I don't know about Westchester, but uh, so that so it's a little confusing. Um, and and I make this observation. Um, we are in the city are seeing record demand for uh, rental um, apartments, as I said before. Uh, but office towers are 60 percent empty meaning that the remote work calculus is still in play. And, and so there are other reasons people are in Manhattan or, or cities in general than their proximity to work. And I think um, uh, a large swath of people that are uh, in, migrating into the city work in other cities like Chicago, but they want to live in Manhattan. Um, so I think it's a little early where I think we have a three to five years on this sort of remote work question. Um, uh, and, and, you know, if you walk in Manhattan right now, anecdotally, you know, streets are busy. Uh, a lot of tourism is back. Um, so I, I think the migration story and the numbers that we're seeing are a little bit, are still lagging. And um, I would be cautious to sort of you know, the point I remember uh, during 2020, you know, it felt like there were going to be 11 people left in Manhattan if you read every headline. Um, and and it simply wasn't true. It was just, it was only telling half the story. It was all outbound migration and there was no inbound until we had a vaccine um, sort of regimen that ramped up pretty quickly. Um, that's, I don't want to say, you know, COVID's still here, but and it'll probably always be here, but it's certainly... Uh, um, you know, the, the, I think the reason now uh, that the city is is booming is because now remote allows people to live there and work somewhere else. One of my sons is moving to Boston um, from uh, from Fairfield County, and uh, his boss never allowed remote work in their history of their company, and they're going to do that when he moves to Boston. So people are changing their sort of standards of the way they view that and we don't really quite know how it's going to work out but i suspect it's not gloom and doom i i remember saying at the time in mid 2020 that that migration out of manhattan and brooklyn largely out to the suburbs and not i'm talking about the suburban migration you know the yeah what we all heard about at the time was that and, and it made sense right i mean you live in manhattan because you want to go to restaurants and you like the culture and and if everything shut down um and and what i said at the time was that anyone who was thinking of moving in the next couple of years just said let's just do it now like we were gonna have exactly. a kid next year and we're gonna go get a house in the suburbs let's start looking now because there's no reason to be here today and so right. I, I do think, and we'll see how the numbers play out this next year. I do think that what we did was we stole in 2020 and 21, we stole a lot of migratory buyers from Manhattan that would have moved in 2023 and 2024, which means that the migratory numbers might go down, except for, as uh, Jonathan just pointed out, it, it might act, the stream might continue if the work from home continues to have salience and people want to move out. I mean, they did a study at um, uh, uh, what's the uh, the think tank up in uh, Newburgh. Um, they uh, they did a study of the migratory pattern. and They found that actually the places that benefited most from the migration out of New York City were the outer outer suburbs, not Rockland County, but like Dutchess and Columbia County benefited more because people are like, well, I mean, I don't even need to be within half an hour of Manhattan. I could be hour and a half away. Um, yeah. And I don't need to have a commute because I'm not going every day into Manhattan. So I can do the once a week, two hour commute if I have to. Um, so, you know, we, I think we, we, we stole a little bit. It may continue because of that, but I, I do think, I remember being on a call with Bess Friedman. Um, on, I think it was one of these, um, the chair of, um, or the CEO of um, uh, Brown Harris. Brown Harris. And she, um, you know, she was saying back in fall of 2020 that the city was starting to recover from what was happening in mid 2020. I think Jonathan, you probably said the same thing when we had one of these calls. Yep. And I remember going at then, and I started looking for a place in Manhattan because I looked for a place upstate, and I, it was all picked over. It was like you know when you do yeah. apple picking at the end of October, and you need one of those things to pull the branch down because there's no apples to pick. That's the way it felt like when I went up to the ski resorts 
uh, by uh, by fall of 21. But then you go to Manhattan, there were still really good opportunities to buy something in Manhattan. Um, and, and even like a year after the pandemic started, it still felt very, very empty, like things were still closed up and it was still very difficult. But, you know, I, I've been there recently and it feels like Manhattan. I mean, it feels like it, it felt five years ago. It doesn't feel any different. I've been walking around doing stuff. So I, don't, I think the city's fine. I think the city's back to where it was. The question is, I think, as Jonathan pointed out, the real question is going to be what happens with office space, because that is that's going to be really challenged, I think, by a dramatic change in social more and working culture and things like that. I read I'm an article middle, about, uh, uh, sorry, no, I, said, I read no, an article about people converting office spaces back to residential buildings. And those filings have been the highest in the last 12 years. That, you know, the Department of Building is getting applications to convert office buildings back to residential buildings. So the demand for residential is higher than the office use. Right. Actually, uh, the Partnership for a Better New York, which is a sort of trade group promoting New York City, uh, said that uh, this is about a month, month and a half ago, I think, said that only 8% of office workers work five days a week in the office. Um, so, uh, and I think the other observation here about sort of figuring out the calculus of remote and the relationship between work and home is that, uh, this we've been going on, you know, this is not like a two month sort of experiment. Um, this has been going on, you know, uh, several years and people are sort of embedded in the, in their mindset. Now work from home is not going away. It may not be as extreme as it is now, but it's not going away. And that has implications for housing. I think it has positive impact for, um, for the suburban markets, um, someone like myself, my wife and I just moved a half an hour farther from the city because I only go in two days a week. Um, so I have a longer commute, but only two days a week. And that's a trade-off that was appealing. Right. Um, I know that just in terms of the conversation we've been having, you know, a lot of questions that I was going to ask you have been answered. So I'd like to check to see if any of the people on the call have questions for you. So none have been submitted at this time. Um, so we are free to continue on. Thank you. Okay, um, online companies like Zillow are impacting agency as well as the customer experience. So how would you describe the impact on agents, buyers, and sellers, and what does this mean for the industry? Are buyers and sellers willing to work with more information that is less vetted, or do they prefer the, you know, agent experience? And I think they prefer the agent experience, but I think the direction, the technology, and the phone, when everybody can simply have a Zillow app or or app real estate which drives them and notifies them of a new home and a question usually drives that ease ask question to agent kind of lead progression so i think uh, you know um yes when they're ready to make the decision but i think the the lot of the soft inquiries are are, are really being driven away as no longer a phone call to a real estate office and says hey what do you have it's, it's more technology use and, and lead driven and then directed from them to the professionals. Okay. I, I, so, Roseanne, I was just yeah. gonna say, I think the vetted approach is where I see the trend going. Um, you know, er, everyone knows what's available online. Um, they do their due diligence, but then they wanna vet their due diligence with a professional. And especially inbound um, urban buyers coming out of Manhattan, whether you're going to Long Island, Westchester, Rockland, or any of the outer boroughs, I, I think a lot of, um, especially the younger millennial buyers, are approaching this from a very vetted perspective. Thank you. Um, we have uh, just a few more minutes, so. I would just like to ask each of you if you would like to just um, 
encapsulate what you feel we're going to be looking at over the next few months. Joe? Uh, don't panic. The classic words from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Don't panic. Everything's going to be fine. The, the, the media is the terrible place to get your information about the housing market simply because they will amplify whatever affect people have. So if things are going well, then they're supercharged. And if they're slowing down, they've basically crashed. And there's nothing like that going on right now. Um, so I would tell agents and I would tell consumers, like, if you're a buyer, don't think that you can make an offer 20% below the asking price and that uh, you're going to get it snapped up. That's not going to happen. There just isn't enough inventory for that. If you're a seller, I would say, you know, the fact that your neighbor got, you know, 800,000 for her house, you know, six months ago, doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get 800,000 today. Um, and so don't, don't poo poo a decent offer um, that you get with the idea that why, why aren't I getting more than uh, my neighbor got last year? Well, the neighbor was able to sell to somebody who got a three and a half percent mortgage, your buyer is going to get a 6% mortgage and they, they can afford less house as a result. And for agents, what I would just tell the agents is listen, there are fundamental things that you can do to be successful, um, none of which involve sitting in the office complaining about the market. That is absolutely not a recipe for being successful in the industry. I'll leave you with that. Thank you. Jonathan? Um, yeah, so uh, that was well said. Uh, I um, I use this set of numbers to explain sort of the optics of what's happening now and why there is actually a pretty firm underpinning under price um, is uh, I... I used to, I lived in Darien, Connecticut for over 30 years. We just moved and it's still in Connecticut. But I remember the three or four years before the pandemic lockdown hit, uh, inventory in my town was about 200 listings, condos, single families, uh, you know, plus or minus, but, you know, seasons and all that. But it was 200. A year after the pandemic hit, it was 50. And so there was this, you know, my goodness, you know, inventory's collapsed. Uh, a year later, before the Fed rate increases in the beginning of 22, there were 12. So it went from 200 to 12. <laughs> and, and then if you read sort of, you know, uh, and look at some of the numbers, inventory has quadrupled. So now it's 50. And it's down from 200 as a normalization. That's my point that, uh, that, that I think the characteristics of this market, um, inventory isn't behaving as one would typically expect. Inventory has been obliterated uh, during this pandemic. And I think, I think that's, that's your focus going forward in this market. And that does provide a firm underpinning in pricing, um, but clearly you know expect with higher rates, lower transaction volume, for sure. Okay, thank you. Gabe? Fundamentally agree with everything Jonathan just said. And, you know, my feeling is we're going to continue to see a very significant housing shortage um, on a national level. Um, it's going to obviously be more pronounced market to market, um, but specifically in some of our key regional markets, because there's no more land, developers can't add inventory. The only inventory we can add in the urban markets is redevelopment, and that's generally a lot more costly uh, to the consumer. So from that perspective, um, you know, I, I think that we're going to continue to see, you know, a leveling of pricing. Um, demand will probably even out over the next I'm going to say 12 to 18 months. I do not think we're going to have a good fourth quarter. Um, I think the end of the fourth quarter is going to be an obliteration of job loss in the Fortune 500 uh, sector. And those will generally be jobs that are over 200, 250,000 um, income producers. And most of those people will be over 55. So they will exit our market. Um, but that doesn't, but that's actually a benefit because then that will create inventory for younger buyers. But I, I don't think we're coming into a good quarter. Thank you. Chinton? I agree with Gabe. I think uh, the fourth quarter will be the softest of all you know, for the 2022. But 
I think it might just be a beginning of hope between the election year coming in, people are staying on the sideline, sellers are coming to realistic prices than the highest price they got. And I think election year with inventory increasing in the spring of 2023 um, will be a, a good start. So my, my suggestion to the young professional is uh, be patient, use the time to educate yourself and be better in this time. And, and those who have done amazing, you know, enjoy this quarter because the you know, year is a, you know, a lot of people have put down tremendous amount of work in last two and a half years as realtors between virtual open houses, doing illegal showings and whatever needed to be done to survive and keep our industry going. So I thank you those who persevere in these times and um, makes me feel proud to be a realtor along with them. And um, I think the tremendous uh, opportunities will start coming in spring of 2023. So it's just a passing of this uh, slow time or pause, uh, which could be used for a benefit to learn and educate and adjust to the new, new real estate market. Well, thank you all for your great and candid information. I will turn this back over to Brian to close us out. Yes, thank you. What a fantastic panel discussion with lots of useful information. Thank you, Roseanne, Jonathan, Gabe, Joe, and Shinton. Uh, before we wrap up, Anthony, would you like to say any uh, final thoughts? Is Anthony with us? Yes, I am. Um, it, what a what a robust conversation. Um, the takeaways are golden handcuffs. I need to talk to Jonathan about dad dad jokes and uh, the poll to pull the apple branches down and the term obliteration. I mean, it's been great information, tremendous um, knowledge that you bring to the panel. Uh, we thank you for your wisdom and time that you've invested in sharing it with us. You know, as uh, your Hudson Gateway president, I thank you and I thank my chairs, uh, Brian and uh, Tony for their hard work. And uh, gentlemen, you have made this day very productive for us. A lot to think, a lot to learn, and I appreciate your time. And thank you once again. Thank, thank you. For, uh, thank, thank you, Anthony. Thank you, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Everybody. Awesome. Thank you. Well, we hope thank you enjoyed you. today's webinar, sponsored by the Hudson Gateway Association of Realtors Education Committee. In addition to events like this, the HDR School of Education provides compelling classes for continuing education credit uh, taught by top faculty. For more information, go to hjr.com. Click on the take a class and choose from the drop down, drop down menu. Thank you all for joining. Thanks, Take Brian. Care. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye.